plan for the presentation today is just to go through a real brief history of the UCSA so you can see kind of where we've come from, how we incorporate student voice into what we do at the UCSA. We'll let you know about our specific services that our team offers students at UC. And then we'll talk about the preventative initiatives that we have created. Cool. So here's a rough timeline that kind of goes back to the 1800s. So the university was first called Canterbury College and it was established in 1873. It was a unique university because it accepted both male and female students, which was not common practice at the time. And then the Canterbury College Students Association was established in 1894 to give the many clubs and societies that had formed within the university some formal representation. And so this is us, um, what we are now. In 1949, the Canterbury College Students Association decided to change their name to University of Canterbury Students Association. And the university and the association just continued to grow from there on after. So fast forward to today, 2024, UCSA is a very large organization with 15 elected student executive members. We have over 300 staff members in a variety of different departments, and we oversee around 160 student clubs. So how we incorporate the student voice at UCSA. So with the 15 student executive members, they're actually elected by the student body each year. So students, students can nominate themselves for a position, but it's up to the student population to choose who they think is best. And the 15 roles are made up of a president, two vice presidents, seven faculty related exec, and then targeted roles for postgrads, equity and diversity, Pacifica, Maori, and international students. So students can raise like large systemic issues with the student executive members directly. And then when the executives go to their relevant board or faculty meetings, then they can take those issues and raise them at that platform. Our team, the advocacy and welfare team, we support individual students with a very specific matter. So uh, complaints, yeah, those types of things. So we guide them through a process, through the university's process, um, or we help them apply for financial assistance. So those are kind of the, the difference between the student exec and our roles, but we do work together and we'll go through some specific examples in more detail, but we, we have grant panels. So if students apply for financial assistance, we have two student execs that sit on those panels because it is student money and we wanna make sure that two students are happy with that student money going to the student who is applying. We also have well-being expos and we organize some cooking demonstrations. And so the exec help us through all of these things and we'll go through in more detail as we progress through the presentation. Okay, now Ely's gonna talk about Student Voice Partnership Group. So the University of Canterbury recognizes UCSA as the overarching representative of UC students. So um, a group called the Student Voice Partnership Group was set up. So it is the primary body that manages partnership between UC and UCSA in relation to student well-being, facilities management, accommodation, support services, and events. So it is a, forum, a formal forum for UCSA representatives to present view of student body to UC management, and for UC representatives to present proposals and views of UC to UCSA, and to consult on issues and opportunities that may have an impact on students. The group acts as an advisory body for university policy development that has direct impact on students. It is a place for both UC and UCSA to escalate issues or concerns that do not fit within other student uh, representative structures. The group informs, advises, and makes recommendations to the vice chancellor or UC senior leadership team. It recognizes that UC and UCSA are organizations that are independent from each other. There is an even balance of UC and UCSA representatives in the group, and it requires both quorum and majority vote when making decisions regarding the use of campus enhance enhancement funds. Slide. <laughs> awesome, thanks, Yuli. Okay, so you might be wondering how we at the UCSA are funded. So UC has the student services levy fee. 
And so each student who enrolls has to pay this fee. So this year we've got over 22,000 students and students pay kind of per course that they're enrolled in. And so each course is about 15 points. So it's $137 per 15 points. So if you were a full-time student, you'd be paying a little over $1,000. There is a cap of this. Um, so if once you reach kind of over 150 points per year, you don't have to pay any more than that. But distant students get a 20% discount. So we have a lot of students who might be studying in Nelson or Blenheim or yeah, any other place in the country and they just go through online through the courses. So they're not using as much resources. So the university recognizes that. So in total, from all the students that were enrolled, we had 15.8 million collected. And then that's dispersed between all the different services. So in terms of our service, we get, so the UCSA as a total receives 3.8 million, which is 24% of the total SSL. And our team receives a portion of that 1.2 million, which is 32% of the UCSA's funding. So um, in terms of what we do, we've got advocacy side and the welfare side. So on the advocacy side, we help students if they want to appeal a decision that was made by the university or by a staff member and they're not happy with it. If something's happened and the student wants to make a formal complaint against the staff member, we help through that process. A special consideration application, if the student is unwell, not able to perform their best or not able to sit a test, then they apply to be, I guess, considered for, for that. They have to provide evidence and, and write a blurb, so we help them through that. We can attend meetings on behalf um, or with the student. And academic progress is when they have not passed enough courses and the university has to talk to them about what's going on. Um, do they allow the student to continue? Then we go with the student to those meetings and help explain to them what, what their options are. In terms of welfare, we have a food bank hardship grant, medical prescription grant, and optometry grants. And then we have also decided to create some little side services in addition to those, because um, we've seen some interesting situations from students and talking with the exec and hearing yeah, different things. So we thought, how can we prevent some of those issues? So we'll just briefly kind of summarize what each of these are. Um, and then if you have questions about specific details, we're happy to answer those at the end. So subsidized dental service, it was around 2012 that quite a few students were asking for hardship grants to help with dental costs, such as wisdom teeth or root canals. So in 2013, the UCSA thought it would be really great if they created their own subsidized dental service to encourage students to actually go to the dentist regularly make it more affordable so that they didn't leave these issues to get bigger and bigger and then more expensive as a consequence. So that's been running since 2013 and it's been really successful. The Path Seekers program is new this year and it's, it's kind of like a buddy program. We pair up experienced senior students with newer or less confident students who might need more support. They meet once or twice a term we give them vouchers so they can buy a coffee and have that chat. They just talk about uni, how it go, how's it going, the support services available on campus that this, the new student might not be aware of, and just sharing stories, strategies, tips of, of getting through uni. Budget planning service is it's not meant to be formal budget advice, but we help the student look at their income and their expenses, and then we help them set like a realistic weekly budget for them to follow so that they don't run out of money and not be able to afford rent at the end of the week. The meal planning guide is a booklet we've created that goes through five meals that are relatively affordable, not time consuming at all, to encourage students to cook at home or cook as a flat. And it gives them like grocery shopping guide and how to stock up a pantry with the essentials so you have ingredients to make stuff relatively easily. And then we give that to the students who are going through budget planning as well. The cooking demonstration and the well-being expos, Ely's gonna go into more detail. So I'll skip those for now. Um, HIV testing is something that we're going to do this year. 
and it's in collaboration with the Burnett Foundation. And so they focus on raising awareness um, and preventing the spread of HIV, specifically among men who have sex with other men. And so we'll be actually doing the HIV testing in the building, in our Students Association building. We'll get um, the medical professionals to come in and have that available for students. The Good One Party Register is in association with the New Zealand Police, and its aim is to help students have safer flat parties. So students can register their parties online. They're going to have a flat party, and the police will come and speak to the students with some tips and strategies so that they can minimize issues during the party. And then if the students do have any issues on the night, they can call the police for immediate assistance. They've already got the details. They already know who they are. They'll just come in and help out. Alrighty, over to Ely now. Okay, so we started our first wellbeing event during the winter of 2015. The ideas for a wellbeing events um, stem from wanting to provide an event during the cold, dreary, crisis winter to students to remind them that we care about them and to give them a time at grandma's house experience. So we have cakes, cookies, hot chocolate, tea and coffee, and we had the university chaplaincy there with a couch, a TV screen that had the image of a fireplace going next to them, and students could choose to sit on the couch with hot drinks and baked goods and chat with the folks from the chaplaincy if they like. We also had Opsalt there to sell a win warm winter clothing for gold coin donations. The event was very well received by students. I remember students asking us, why are you doing this? And when we replied, because we love you guys, they were so stoked. Um, and because of the great feedback from the students, we ran another wellbeing event in summer of 2016, just after the official orientation finish to help students prepare for the new year. We named the summer wellbeing event Summer Starter Expo and the Winter Post Reorientation Wellbeing Event Winter Wellness Expo. And those two events are now part of the orientation and reorientation programs and has grown massively. So we have um, at events, we have 30 individual stallholders consisting of UC support services and community organizations such as Tenancy Services, Citizens Advice Bureau and Lifeline there. All the services featured at our expo are either free for students or very reasonably priced. It gives students a chance to learn what support is available for them and to gather information on how to contact these services if they need them in the future. We entice students to attend by offering free food and giveaways, as well as a petting zoo and friendly dogs. Types of free food we provide are cakes, slices and cookies with gluten-free, daily free, dairy free and make, uh, vegan options. We have free drinks and free barbecue with sausages and veggie patties. And examples of giveaways are towels and caps for Summer Starter Expo, towels, beanies, scarves and socks for Winter Wellness Expo. And we also give out bamboo toothbrushes and toothpaste. Um, with the coffee party, um, UCSA has the tradition of having a big music event at the end of semester two called the Tea Party to celebrate the end of lectures for the year. Students have to buy tickets to the event and they are quite expensive. And the event also has a maximum capacity of 3,000 students, so it doesn't cater to all our students. So although the event is very popular among some students, we heard feedback from many students, especially the international students, that they will also like an event that is alcohol free without loud music so that they can celebrate the end of lectures as well. So we create a coffee party, which I like to also call the not tea party tea party. So coffee party is comparatively smaller than the other two wellbeing events we run. It happens the day before tea party, which is also the last day of lectures. And um, we have smaller groups of people attending. So the only external organization attending is New Lifeline New Zealand. We have university support services there. We play soft listening music. We have bean bags, giant Jenga and chess games out so that students can play with them. We have free cakes, barbecue and drinks, interactive farm animals and friendly doggies. So, this is a picture, some pictures of what happens at our events. 
Um, then we talked about our cooking demonstrations. Um, we have heard from many students that they do not know how to cook and want to learn. And we have seen many students waste a lot of money on takeaways. So we partner with Ilum New World to create cooking videos to show students that it's easy and cheaper to cook at home. With the help from nutritionists from Ilum New World, we plan the cooking videos to feature recipes that use seasonal ingredients. We invited our student executive to do the cooking to show other students that it is possible for them to do it as well. We then released the video seasonally on YouTube and as Instagram Reels. During our well-being events, we have these cooking videos playing as loops next to a table where we have the printed recipes from the videos and recipe sheets put together by health promotion agency for students to pick up as a way to encourage them to cook affordably, uh, affordable and nutritious meals for themselves. The best way for us to describe what the cooking demonstration videos look like is to show you guys an example of them. Good everyone, I'm Xavier. I'm here with the student exec here to make a cooking video alongside New World Island. Alrighty. Time for questions. Sorry if that made you all hungry. I know it's lunchtime over there. I'll jump in if that's okay. Sorry, that was fantastic. Um, really inspiring. Some great initiatives there. Um, I have lots of questions, but I'll start slowly so others can jump in. Um, just regarding you, the. I think you mentioned that distant, I'm not sure how you worded it, but distant campuses have a 20% discount for their student fees. We have something similar here. I'm at Murdoch University in Perth. Um, but what we find is those sort of regional campuses don't have as much, um, you know, facilities and support services um, there. And so we're reflecting if they're paying, if the students that go to that campus are paying 80% of the, the fees, are they getting 80% of the services that we offer at the main campus? And I'm wondering how you kind of, what, what that's like at your university. Yeah, I think, I mean, UC recognises that they won't be able to, you know, use the gym and use the library and those types of things. But um, yeah, it's really kind of, up to the university to decide those things we um yeah we we can still help distance students so we have phone calls or emails or zoom calls with them so a lot of like the the counselors or student care or us will, will be able to assist the distance students in the same way the only thing that we wouldn't be able to help a distance student with is our food bank because i have to physically be here to pick it up as well as the dental service because we only have two partnered clinics that are here in Christchurch um gotcha. yeah but they yeah I think it would be mostly the those two services that would be different um and the rec center um, yeah the rec center and the library those types of things mm -hmm. what we have mm -hmm. noticed though is a, a trend from students that live here in Christchurch don't want to pay the full student levy fee so they enroll as a distance student but still come on campus just as much as any other student <gasps> Quite clever. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Um, the other question I had was regarding the Path Seekers program, I think it was called. Mm -hmm. um, so does your team kind of manage the recruitment of those sort of the, uh, 
a think like a mentor type buddy buddy program. Do they you manage the recruitment of those um, senior students? Um, and also, do they is that just a volunteer system? Um, and or is it paid? And if they if it is just volunteer, how do they get recognised for their their service? Ely, do you want to take this one? Oh sure, um, yes we um, we do. We, one of my team, she's um, our equity focus student and student support advocate. So that's her project. That's her little baby, and so she recruits the volunteers um, and train the volunteers as well. Um, my son is one of the volunteers, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very proud of him. Um, so they are volunteers. They're not paid. What we do is we give. Um, the volunteers coffee vouchers that they can take their buddies to have a coffee nice. and um, they have a sex uh, questions that they can talk to the student um, mm -hmm. just to find out you know what the students are doing are they linking all their emails and how they should do that and all this stuff um, we also um, run sort of um, get together for the for the volunteers and the buddies uh, we have one plan coming up where we as the team will serve the students and our volunteers. So we'll have a barbecue or something and we'll serve them. Um, and the way we recognize them is um, we give them a certificate at the end and we are able to write references for them to say that yes. um, this is what they have done for us. And our certificate, we intend to twist our CE's arm so that she will sign it as well and <laughs> just make it more official. Nice. Thank you. Satoshi, did you want to jump in? Ah, uh, yes. Um, thanks so much for the presentation. Um, just for context, I'm coming from uh, government. I work for the state government in Victoria, Australia. And um, the question I'm asking is in the context of what are the ways in which we can work to support uh, institutions to support their students? So that's the sort of framing of my question. And the question I'm about to ask is a pretty complex one that we, uh, we don't really have a set answer to. So I'm not expecting you to do this at all, but I was particularly interested in um, uh, the sort of student self-advocacy function that you've set up um, uh, in your university. And yeah, it's a, the tricky question is always the sort of students who we should be hearing the most tend to be hardest to reach. They may feel most disengaged from the system. They may be socially marginalized and all this kind of thing. So just wondering whether, um, you know, there's, there's a ways we can sort of uh, uh, tackle, I suppose, you know, how, how, how might we actually address some of these barriers? And again, I'm not expecting to have the answer for this yet. Please take this as a notice. But also uh, related to that is if there are, I'm guessing, you know, there's all kinds of issues that students talk about and some of the things are fairly, uh, very institution centric. The, the, your university can sort of fix it pretty quickly, whereas other issues I'm guessing are sort of tied up in the ways in which university is funded or, you know, legislated or whatever it may be. So there's a bigger, you know, the national level um, issues that the, uh, I suppose, you know, that might come up. I'm just wondering how you might handle um, these different levels of uh, questions. You want to take this one now, Jess? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, no, I'm it's, just, yeah. Yeah, it's um interesting, interesting thing to talk to. So in terms of, let's start with disengaged students. So when, um, that was part of the reason why we started the Past Seekers program, because we heard from students supporting them kind of when it was too late to do anything. They'd come to us, you know, months after an issue or maybe they failed everything and they're going through academic progress. And then we talked to them and like, what happened? And they're like, oh, we just, you know, we didn't want to be a burden on anyone. We didn't want to reach out. We didn't want, you know, we were embarrassed or intimidated or whatever. They just didn't feel like their issue was big enough to go bother someone for it. And that was really sad. So we thought, well, maybe if they don't want to talk to a staff member, then maybe they'll talk to a student. So we thought, well, if we get these senior students and train them so that they have the right answers um, and then pair them up so that they go out and they have a coffee together and you, you know, you're face to face, you can't get away from it. And then we ask our volunteers to ask those really key questions to try to pick out any issues to, to find them early. <laughs> um, so that was one way we thought of, of kind of reaching those disengaged students. And then we have been receiving referrals 
from academic staff that have noticed of like those disengaged students. And so they refer them to us and then we pair them up. And so sometimes they don't have a choice. They're like, you know, oh, I've already been referred. Okay, fine, I'll do it. You know, and they give in at that point. Some we, we can't reach, we email, we call, they still don't want to engage. So that's fine. We can't force them. Um, but, but then yeah, we so contact student care, which is part of the UC support services. And they then can um, do more um, sort of stronger sort of persuasion by, they, I think they can even go to the student's house just to make sure that they are okay. That sort of thing. They can make a welfare calls. Um, we also, um, in our events, we have our table, we have our brochures, and we talk to students there. So that's one way of doing it. Um, UCSA also runs, we have several advisory groups. Um, they are run by our execs. So we have the equity and wellbeing advisory group. We have the postgrad advisory group, international student advisory group, and postgrad advisory group. So those students, when they hear something out there and they will bring it to the advisory group. And then um, if there are individual students that they know about, the execs will then send them to us and then we can help them with it. Great, thank you. In terms of the, the different levels, as you said, the, the hierarchical structure, that can be a bit tricky. So I guess we have, we have different um, roles in terms of us and, and the execs. So we help students if, it, if it's an individual thing that's affected them like just one, maybe one or two students. Um, if it's an issue that's going on across a whole course, then the students are supposed to bring it up with their class rep. And then we can support the class rep through talking about that maybe with the head of department um, or making a formal complaint to the university if it's you know severe enough. Um, if it's a larger systemic issue, like just the, the way a certain process is, and it's actually quite unhelpful for students, then we would raise that with the student executive because then the student executive sit on all the board and faculty meetings or the UC council meetings. And then they can raise those issues there and say, this is affecting all students and it's a big issue and we should look at it. Um, right. No, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Does Great that answer. answer your question? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Really appreciate okay. it. Does anyone else have um, questions? I saw there was one question in the chat, which is from Tracy about, um, the budget like what the budget is for those events that you've been presenting about and how it is funded which I, I think you briefly mentioned in the presentation but if you want to speak more to it yeah sure the the events I guess we don't we don't have a huge budget for the events because um it doesn't cost us a lot we have a, an events team that's part of the UCSA so we, we have the events team do all the organizing for us create the floor plan set up tables um, and then we communicate with the stall holders ourselves. Um, we buy, the biggest expense is probably the free stuff that we buy and the cakes, the food, and we pay for the farm animals. So mm -hmm. it's probably, what, just a couple thousand? Really, yep. would you say? I said I thought about 2,000 per um, expo. And yeah, we buy like the, toothbrushes and uh, the, mainly the bamboo toothbrushes we buy them from aliexpress and then we found timu so much cheaper so we've been buying from timu um and then every time there's a sale we would go and just wrap whatever we can in terms of toothbrush uh, toothpaste um wipe the shop out and we would go to kmart to get the towels and everything again wiping the shop out um <laughs> And, and we're quite thrifty. We check, yes. you know, all the different stores to see who has the best deal. And then we we'll might go shopping on that particular day. We find it so much easier than buying things online. We just, yeah, we're just five yep. of us in our team. So we just fill up trolleys full of stuff. Mm -hmm. And also um, UCSA has a food and beverage and catering business. So we get our kitchen to order the cakes for us. And they are the big slab cakes. And we cut them ourselves. And so that saves up a lot of money for us because we didn't we don't ask the catering staff to do it because they charge labor. So we try to cut costs any way we can just mm. to make it work. Yeah, and with the cooking demonstrations, because of our partnership with I Love New World, they actually pay for the nutritionist, um, New World does. And they we bought the ingredients, which was, I don't know, probably only like $30 if that. Um, yeah, and the exec volunteered so 
um, they, we, they, we didn't pay them extra mm -hmm. to be the chefs. And our comms team did the videos and the editing and stuff. Mm -hmm. Cool. And then um, someone asked how many paid staff are there at the UCA? So we have a little over 300 staff members at the moment. And that's because we have two early learning centers and then our team, the events team, communication and marketing team, production and resource team, uh, functions and catering team, because we have a whole commercial side of our organization. And there's the finance team, administration and reception. And then all the bars and restaurants have their own staff. And then we've just taken over doing a school lunch program for the primary schools across Christchurch. So we have a whole kind of industrial kitchen and they make the school lunches every day and deliver them. So that's funded by the government. That's kind of a separate funding thing. Um, yeah, someone has asked, how do we balance being thrifty and being sustainable? So we tried to buy 100% cotton towels. Uh, the toothbrushes are bamboo. Um, and the we don't buy an excessive amount where anything is wasted. So students literally take everything that we provide. Every expo, we always run out of everything, especially with the cakes. Um, we seem to run out of cake. We order more and more cake every time. But cakes are cardboard boxes. We give them biodegradable cups, napkins for our expos. So we do try to reduce our carbon footprint that way. Um, what else do we have? Yeah, hopefully that answers everybody's questions, but happy to answer more if you have any. Sorry, can I just jump in? Um, my name's Jenna from Murdoch University. I did have to pop out briefly, um, so I'm sorry if I'm if this has already been um, addressed, but um, if you had any events that you've done for engaging online students um, or different ways of engaging online students, um, really interested to hear from yourselves and any others in the in the meeting today. We haven't this year, but in a previous year, especially during COVID, we tried to run our wellbeing expo online um, through Zoom. I think it, it was a bit tricky, but we kind of had short sessions from each of the stalls, kind of give a blurb how they can help, and then students could listen in. And then that kind of just changed every every 15 minutes, but it, it was a lot of information for students to, to grasp. So um, yeah, I'm not sure how effective that was, but at that time we didn't have any other option because of the COVID restrictions. Yeah, that's something to think about, definitely, because we're getting, I think UC is trying to encourage more kind of online mm. studying options. Fantastic. Thank you so much for, for your presentation and for everyone's questions. Uh, we have 10 minutes left and I just pre-created four breakout rooms and you can select um, e e either of those just for the last 10 minutes for us to just connect on topics that are interesting. Um, uh, before we do that, I just wanted to again thank um, E and Jessica for presenting today and sharing what they do. Please join me in uh, virtual claps uh, for them. Thank you for having us.